Hello, this is Mike Corrali, and this is the International Political Economy course. Welcome back. Today, we examine economic determinism and exploitation, the structuralist perspective. In our book, International Political Economy, by David Balaam and Bradford Dillman, we find ourselves in Chapter 4. In Chapter 4, Balaam examines feudalism, capitalism, and socialism, touching on Marx's theory of history. He refers to some specific contributions of Marx to the concept of structuralism, specifically the definition of class, class conflict and the exploitation of workers, the capitalist control over the state, and ideological manipulation. Blom further goes into Lenin and international capitalism, imperialism, and global world orders. We touched on this lightly in our last lecture, but Blom goes further then into modern world system theory, neo-imperialism, and empire building vis-a-vis -vis capitalism. Blom addresses trends in contemporary capitalism and inequality and financial crisis. Balaam's examination, then, rests on some key terms, such as structuralism, historical materialism, the dialectical process, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, false consciousness, dependency theory, modern world system, neo-imperialism, the transnational capitalist class, and interlocking directorates. We're going to go much further using Balaam rather as a, a springboard, a jumping off place, to get deep in the weeds now of structuralism. Just as we did with classic liberalism and mercantilism, using Japan and Germany and then the United States respectively as case studies, in Chapter 4 of Structuralism, we're going to be using France as our case study. And so the seminar question, introducing it now, and then we'll come back as we want to do at the end of today's recording, asks you to examine the elements of economic determinism and exploitation using the structuralist perspective as described in your textbook and in this recorded lecture by using contemporary economic policy of France as a case study. And so then our case study is La Belle France, looking at French history, politics, culture, and economic system to get our arms around the idea of structuralism. In French history, we find that it has manifested itself through five republics and two empires. First, we have the First Republic that was ended in 1803 by Napoleon and the creation of Napoleon's First Empire. We then have the Second Republic that was ended in 1851 by Napoleon III's Second Empire. The Third Republic was ended in 1940 by German occupation. And then the Fourth Republic lasted from 1946 until 1958, so following the liberation of France at the end of World War II, going then until 1958. The Fifth Republic, then, has its originations in the Fourth Republic. The Fourth Republic, again, was established in 1946, and it was a parliamentary form of government that collapsed in 1958. The main cause of its collapse was its political instability. The parliament in the Fourth Republic was very fragmented, and the executive was very weak as a result of unstable parliamentary coalitions. And we remember from our conversations both in Japan and Germany, parliamentary coalitions refers to bringing together distinct parties minority parties to form a coalition, to form a government. So 
when the situation in the Algerian War of 1954 to 1962, a colonial war in France, became worse, and the government failed as a result. So the origins of the Fifth French Republic saw its beginnings with General Charles de Gaulle, who had headed up the French government in exile during World War II, during the German occupation. He lived from 1890 to 1970, and he had actually retired from politics in 1946, but at the request of the French came back in 1958 to propose and reform the Constitution in order to strengthen the executive and then limit the power of the Parliament. And so in September of 1958, the new French Constitution was approved by referendum, and on October 4, 1958, the new Constitution entered in force. The Constitution of 1958 created a new system that was called semi-presidential. And so instead of having a parliamentary form of government, we have now a semi-presidential. So the term was first introduced by the famous French scientist Maurice de Viger. It is disputed, and not all scientists accept it or agree on the countries which belong to this idea of a semi-presidential government. The essential forms of the current French government include a president of the republic who serves as head of state. They are elected for five years, well, since constitutional revision of 2000, before it was seven years, and they are elected through direct universal suffrage with some very significant powers of political direction. Another aspect of an essential form of the French government is that it includes a prime minister. The government is guided by the prime minister who is appointed by the president, but is politically accountable to the parliament, which can revoke their confidence in prime minister. So in many cases, the head of state and the head of government are two different offices. Whether they that office is head of state or head of government, and whether that is a prime minister or a president, is different from system of government to system of government. In France, though, the government is guided by the prime minister who is appointed by the president. The president is head of state. The prime minister, ostensibly, is head of government. There are other essential elements to the French form of government. It is a system of distribution of executive power that implies a sharing of political functions between the head of state and the head of government, and therefore doesn't exclude the possibility of a political conflict among them about the exercise of that power. Indeed, the office of the president is the result of a compromise between de Gaulle's more radical ideas in that he wanted to give powers of political direction to the president, and those who inclined toward the parliamentary system and wanted to imitate the Westminster model as found in the United Kingdom. The outcome was a system where the president had mostly arbitrary functions within a form of government that significantly weakened the powers of the parliament and the political parties, strengthened the powers of the executive, but did not assign to the president the direction of the executive. Well, so you have the Constitution versus the actual role of the president. In France, the Constitution seems to assign to the president a mostly arbitral function or an arbitrary function. However, if one analyzes the single functions assigned to the president and the ways in which those functions are concretely exercised, one can appreciate the politically active role that the president plays, um, and they enjoy a decisional autonomy. Buck stops here autonomy, which heads of state and parliamentary forms of government don't often have. The president controls the government according to the French Constitution in Article 9. It is the president and not the prime minister who presides at the Council of Ministers and decides the agenda. The president has the power to dissolve the National Assembly, this is found in Article 12, and the only limitation 
is the prohibition to dissolve the assembly in the year following the elections. The president has the classic powers as head of state. Other powers of the president are similar to those assigned to heads of state in parliamentary systems, such as signing ordinances and governmental decrees, appointing some categories of civil and military officials, accrediting foreign diplomats, granting pardon, and addressing the parliament. We know that really the president controls the government. The president appoints the prime minister and by virtue of being able to appoint them is also able to remove them. The president then has the control of government. Even though the prime minister ostensibly controls government, the president controls the prime minister, therefore the president controls the government. The interpretive praxis imposed since 1959 by de Gaulle assigns to the president a real power of revocation of the prime minister and therefore of the government. And so to recap then the president's power is as head of state. In this instance, we're dealing with Macron, so I can positively say he appoints the prime minister, appoints ministers, can dissolve the National Assembly, can submit legislation to referendum on proposed government or parliament, has the emergency power of up to six months, is commander-in-chief of the armed forces, and as I suggested earlier, his term was reduced from seven years to five years, established in 2000, and now also has a two-term limit of these five-year terms, so a total of 10 years, and that was established in 2008. The French government also allows for the possibility of a referendum. And these are two presidential powers that deserve particular attention. Article 2 of the French Constitution grants the president the power to present a draft law for approval through a referendum without a prior parliamentary vote. So in other words, the people can approve a law proposed by the president directly to their, to their referral without having parliament in the process. The matters which may be the object of a referendum regard the organization of the public authorities, the ratification of an international treaty that may affect the functioning of state institutions, any reforms of the economic, social, or environmental policy of the nation, and reforms of the relative public services. The president may call for a referendum only through a proposal by the government or the parliament. The procedure can be used by the president to bypass a hostile parliament, obviously, with the necessary support of the government behind him. In 2008, the constitutional reform gave a similar power on the same matters to one-fifth of the members of parliament, or about 182 people, supported by one-tenth of the electors, or 4.2 million people. The referendum in this mechanism may not be called for by the people directly, which is an exception to systems that do allow referenda because the meaning of the referenda is usually direct popular initiative and participation, as it is in the state of California that we know. And so really the working relationship between the president and the prime minister is key. The president again appoints and chooses the prime minister and other ministers. The president chairs the council of ministers and so the prime minister has to harness parliamentary majority for presidential policies. Parliament's motion of censure against the government then would call for a failure of the prime minister and therefore the need for the president to reappoint a new prime minister. So we touched on the powers of the president. What are the powers then of the prime minister? The constitution, in fact, assigns also to the prime minister very significant powers of political direction. This is consistent with the general strengthening of the executive versus the legislature introduced by Charles de Gaulle in the 1958 Constitution, specifically in Articles 20 and 21 of the French Constitution. The interpretation of the Constitution of de Gaulle and his party shifted the center of gravity of the system toward the president to give the president more power in relation to the parliament, because that was the problem with the prior Constitution. It kept uh, stalling because parliamentary cohesion was lacking. But the Constitution allows also a different allocation of power. Insofar as the legislature is concerned, as we've touched on a number of times, the 1958 French Constitution 
restricted the power of Parliament in the Fifth Republic. Its makeup is thus. There are two houses, a National Assembly of 577 members, and an upper house, a Senate, of 321. Senators are indirectly elected by an electoral college. This is representative of less than 50,000 people. They are selected by municipal, departmental, and regional councils, and rural constituencies are often overrepresented. The Senate can initiate legislation. The Senate must consider all bills adopted by the National Assembly. If the two houses disagree, government can appoint a joint committee to try to resolve those differences or government can resubmit the bill to the National Assembly for a definitive vote. Then this more representative, this broader, ostensibly lower chamber, the National Assembly, in which there are 577 deputies, each elected by a single member constituency through a two-round voting system. Thus, 289 seats are required for a majority in the National Assembly. The Assembly is presided over by a president, currently Richard Ferrand, nominally from the largest party represented, assisted by vice presidents from across the represented political spectrum. The term of the National Assembly is five years. However, the President of the Republic may dissolve the Assembly, as we've talked about before, thereby calling for new elections unless it has been dissolved in the preceding 12 months. The judiciary in France is a little different from that in the United States. France has no tradition of judicial review. Until 1958, courts determined guilt or innocence of individuals accused of crime. It also has now a constitutional council. The council examines legislation and international treaties and decides whether or not they conform to the constitution. In the bureaucracy of France, we find civil servants in which Political parties, the National Assembly, the Cabinet, and big business are dominated, usually by former civil servants. They call this the Grand Corps, the bureaucracy. The recruitment process for elites invariably includes an education in one of the more grand schools, Ivy League schools, particularly the École Nationale d'Administration and the École Polytechnique. The Grand's, the Grand's Corps is a highly competent, well-educated group of administrators. The elite is highly integrated and plays a major role in decision-making in and outside of government. This slide shows a schematic of the government as it's been described heretofore. You can pause the lecture at this point to kind of review it and see where these different elements fit in and how they flow to each other. In speaking to the economic, social, and geographical characteristics of France and how that contributes to its political economic expression, French political culture is generally influenced by economic, social, and geographic characteristics, obviously, of France. France is densely populated with an approximate population of 57 million. Although the typical French citizen lives in an urban area today, the agricultural areas of France do remain strong. Social and economic gaps exist between Parisians, those who live in Paris, and the rest of the country, with per capita income in Paris about 60% higher than those in the rest of the country. The northeast quadrant around Paris is highly urbanized and industrialized, while the west and the south remain rural and agricultural. France, obviously, is famous for its wine, its produce, its poultry, its grains, and its geese. There is a vital importance to the ideology in France and as it is linked to its history. The French are fascinated with their own history and love abstract and symbolic discussions. They have their roots in the days of the absolute monarchs when intellectuals and the bourgeoisie had no status and in response to their demands the monarchs gave them the right to discuss abstractions freely. There is an inherent distrust of government and politics in France. The modern tendency is to distrust the government, but that tendency 
to criticize the government and think it not to be trusted does not affect the loyalty that the common citizen holds for local government officials or representatives in prior lectures we've defined nationalism and we've compared it and contrasted it to populism in france there is a very important dearly held sense of nationalism the legitimacy of the government is based largely on a broad-based sense of nationalism a pride in france a love of its history and an instinct to preserve french culture that is alive and well in the hearts of most french citizens so despite the conflict and disagreements in and among the french french political culture is held together by this very important sense of nationalism there has been in the past very conflictual political culture an agreement to disagree the division in political opinions into left and right is nothing new to france it goes back to the french revolution and remains an important force today consensus often has been reached by uniting behind a strong charismatic leader only only to be lost when the leader dies or goes into disfavor cycles of consensus followed by alienation seem to be typical of the french political culture now this conflictual political culture is going to come into play very definitely when we talk about our seminar question when we reintroduce our seminar question and so in society and politics there are divisions in in france divisions between the middle class and the working class between the rural and the urban between religious and non-religious and between the native french and immigrants in the political parties of france we find a multi-party system and we know until the fifth republic parties have been weak and unstable with party membership being relatively low as in the united states very few voters are actually members of political parties currently the parties have stabilized and appear to be forming long-lasting coalitions than those they experienced in the third and fourth republics five major political parties still are very important in determining policy and defining voting behavior the parties in france currently are the udi which are the union democrats and independents and they date from 2012 you have the socialist party which includes social democracy and dozens of iterations and they harken back actually to 1929 you have the dm or the democratic movement that began its participation in 2017 you have lr or les republicans who began their party in 2002 and you have the rem the republicans who were established in 2016 and so while there are five major parties you'll find that with the exception of the socialist party all of them have been formed in the last 20 years and so parties are a vibrant contemporary reflection of the politics and the ideologies of the voting public generally so again on the left you have the communist party the pcf and the socialist party the ps and on the right you have the rally for the republic rpr the union for french democracy udf and the national front interest groups in france are numerous but weak they're fragmented the most powerful ones tend to be the unions the strongest one the cgt the general confederation of labor is affiliated with the communist party the cfdt the french democratic confederation of labor actually began as a catholic union but dropped its ties to the church during the 1970s and now has closer ties to the socialist party the workers force is the most moderate of the three but also has some connections to the socialist party now again this is going to become important because if we're talking about determinism and structuralism we're really talking about in great effect socialism and the effect of marx on socialist ideology in public policy in france there is a powerful combination of a strong executive then firm parliamentary majorities and an integrated 
competent political elite. In recent years, however, the regime has faced serious problems in adapting to the growing importance of international forces that have weakened the economy and the political system. Which brings us to our study of Marxism and socialism and structuralism. So structuralist ideas are deeply rooted in Marxist analysis and focus on how the dominant structures of society exploit class interests and relative economic, legal, and political institutions. Let me do that one more time. This is what Balaam is saying, but this is also relating then Marxism to the current French constitution and its process of and its political process. Structuralist ideas are rooted in Marxist analysis and focus on how the dominant structures of society exploit class interests and relative economic, legal, and political institutions. In other words, people's actions are shaped by society and in particular by the economic system. And so structuralism then is an expression of Marxism. And if you're looking for a quote that best exemplifies Marxism, something that you can tie up in a bow and put on your mantelpiece, would be from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. To, for, in my mind, that is the foundation of Marxism. So natural evolution was clear in the eyes of Marx. As an historian, Marx saw the forward movement of history as natural evolution. As the proletariat became more and more misused, and as it grew in size, the wealth of the world would be aggregated into fewer hands. In a revolution, the lower class would rise up and throw out the few remaining bourgeois and create economic equality for all people. Marx suggested that a period of dictatorship by the proletariat would be necessary to establish order, but afterwards the state would slowly cease to exist, as only one equal class would exist, thereby eliminating the need for a state to regulate things. Once the state ceases to exist in any meaningful form, pure communism would be in place, fostering an age of cooperation and socio-economic equality for the first time in human history. Private property would cease to exist, and the workers would break their metaphorical chains, no longer bound to anyone. We know that Marx never lived to see a communist revolution. The Russian Revolution of 1917 is usually the first thing that comes to mind when searching for examples of revolutions as Marx foresaw them, although many scholars would dispute the notion that the Russian Revolution of 1917 was Marxist in anything but name. The closest the world ever came to a true Marx-esque revolution would probably be the Paris Commune of 1871, a revolt that Marx strongly approved of. Marxist communism, or scientific socialism, is undoubtedly one of the most important movements in history. Its analytical approach using history and philosophy differed sharply from the previous dreamy socialist views of utopian societies brought about through cooperative or peaceful efforts. The proponents of Marxism advanced immeasurably the belief that the economy influences historical development. As Bill Clinton's campaign was fond of saying, it's the economy, stupid, a rather revolutionary idea. And so there are some key concepts when we look at Marxism. In Marx's theory of historical materialism, a mode of production is the mix of productive forces, i.e. human labor and the means of production, and social and technological relations of production, such as property, power, and control, work through associations and through relations between people. In other words, really the same origins as liberal approaches. Focus on economic relations under capitalism and globalism. There are the possibilities of cooperation inherent in liberalism that is replaced with structural imperatives of capitalism, such as class conflict. Marxism is interested in issues that are discursively excluded 
by liberalism and mercantilism, even realism, such as exploitation of the working class and inequality between classes. Other key concepts derived from Marx, as I suggest, include the mode of production, the basic system of production, and in, that impacts all other social relations. So the economy is going to impact social relations, is going to impact culture, is going to impact politics. And so then the relations of production, society's laws, the politics, the culture, and the ideology create the social superstructure that determine, is determined by the mode of production. In a capitalist society, then, what he's suggesting is the mode of production in a liberal, classic, capitalist society is going to drive those societies' laws, politics, culture, and identity. Ideology. In the importance of history, there are specific historical and geographical settings that have different modes and relations of production. Remember, Marx is all about class and the class struggle. So each mode of production organizes individuals into different classes. In capitalism, then, those classes are those who own and control the means of production, the capitalists or the bourgeois, and those who sell their labor, their time, to the capitalists or the proletariat. And so this class struggle is the struggle between classes that Marx suggests drives history. So again, what is the proletariat? The proletariat in Marx's ideal is that class in society which draws its means of livelihood wholly and, so and solely from the sale of its labor and not from the profit of any kind of capital, any kind of investment. So the proletariat or the class of proletarians is in fact the working class of the 19th century or the 1800s. So how did the proletariat originate? The proletariat originated in the Industrial Revolution, which took place in England in the second half of the 18th century and which has since been repeated worldwide. This Industrial Revolution was brought about by the invention of the steam engine. Remember we talked about Schumpeter? and creative destruction? Ah, this is it. The Industrial Revolution was brought about by the invention of the steam engine, various spinning machines, the power boom, and a whole series of other mechanical devices. These machines, which were very expensive and hence could only be bought by big capitalists, altered the whole previous mode of production and ousted the former workers because machines turned out cheaper and better commodities than could the workers with their inefficient spinning wheels and hand looms. These machines delivered indus industry wholly into the hands of big capitalists and rendered the workers' properties, tools, hand looms, worthless, so that the capitalists soon had everything in their hands and nothing remained to the workers. That's the proletariat. And so then who are the bourgeois? The bourgeois is the class of big capitalists who in all civilized countries are already in almost exclusive possession of all the means of subsistence and of the raw materials and instruments, machines, factories, necessary for the production of the means of subsistence. This is the bourgeois class or the bourgeoisie in Marx's definitions. So where the rubber meets the road, right? Bolshevism. The strategy developed by the Bolsheviks between 1903 and 1917 with a view to seizing state power and establishing a dictatorship then of the proletariat. So the Bolsheviks were members of the Russian Socialist Democratic Workers' Party that seized power in Russia in November of 1917. A subset was called Fabian Socialism. For the Fabians, legislation, protest, and local action was the way to achieve socialist ends and offered the greatest potential cure for the plight of the proletariat. They chose education and general acceptance of socialist thought instead of revolution or forced 
violent indoctrination, which leads us to Leninism. And we've touched on Lenin um, once or twice in previous lectures. Coming back to him, the success of the Russian Revolution of 1917 showed the first examples of Marx's spirit, if not his complete ideology, triumphing against an established government, the establishment of the, the government of the Tsar in pre-revolutionary Russia. This triumph created the first officially socialist state in the history of the world, with Vladimir Lenin known to history as, as Lenin at its helm. Though Lenin accepted most of Marx's ideology, he altered some of his theories and added much to them as well. Whether he knew it or not, Lenin had opened the door for decades of revision, reinterpretation, and manipulation of the true Marxist tradition. Marxist Leninism, or Leninist Marxism, as perhaps a more fitting name, had been born. So not, of, not all of Lenin's ideas were based on a lust for power. He advanced very real ideas about communism wrote numerous works regarding the political implications of socialism and communism, public policy, as well as capitalist theory. In a book that I've mentioned prior to, Imperialism, the highest stage of imperialism, he studies capitalism with the same scientific enthusiasm that Marx did. Lenin would probably define Leninism as Marxism with a real-life approach. Some would agree. Others would call it a cold, calculated dictatorship. The death of Lenin, and with it the end of pure Leninism, launched two leaders, Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin, into the spotlight. After a great deal of turmoil, Stalin won the power struggle and later exiled Trotsky from the Soviet Union in 1929. Trotsky eventually fled to Mexico. Two new competing ideologies now sprang up, Trotskyism and Stalinism. Trotskyism was very much in the same vein as Marxist-Leninism. However, Stalinism took a radically different course. So, again, Trotskyism, the political and economic theories of communism advocated to Leon Trotsky and his followers, usually included the principle of a worldwide revolution. Trotskyites generally view the Soviet Union as the ultimate place to begin any sort of revolution and continue to support its isolation from what they viewed as imperialist and capitalist intrusion or engagement by the United States and other Western nations. Most Russian Trotskyites were thrown out of the USSR or killed during Stalin's many purges, but still hoped to one day return to, perform, to reform the USSR that they now viewed as a deformed worker's state. Trotsky was a realist and felt that socialism needed to be advanced in new ways since Marxism had failed in the first international and eventually devolved into Bolshevism, which led into his hated Stalinism. So what is Stalinism? Stalinism is the bureaucratic authoritarian exercise of state power and mechanistic application of Marxist-Leninist principles associated with Joseph Stalin. Stalin added little real theory to the Marxist tradition, though he did offer some pointers on governing with communist principles. He differed from Trotsky in that he believed that socialism could exist and thrive in a single country without a permanent world revolution. Furthermore, he suggested the idea that class struggle intensifies as the government moves from one success to another. The bottom line on Stalinism is that it was Leninism taken to the next level, the goal of centralized power and a massive bureaucracy increased. So we remember then Marxist economic. Labor is the basis of all value. Total direct and indirect labor in the production determines true price of a product. How much it actually takes to make a widget, then, would be the natural price of that widget. So profits, then, are based on surplus value. Capitalism is always exploitative. So 
in capitalism then if it costs a dollar to make a widget and with the labor behind making a widget it costs a dollar if you then sell it for five dollars then that capitalist model of selling is in itself exploitative increases in profit are only achieved by increasing the extraction of surplus value and capitalism being dynamic would spread this is the classic marxist economic ideology so furthering marxist economics a key analytical claim is that capitalism is based on fundamental tensions first there is economic concentration so competitive markets produce concentration i.e monopolies why would you want to be competitive why would you want to compete it's more natural to want to hold hold the widget market um, at hostage to have all the possible widgets and to make all the possible widgets competition then competitive markets tends to concentrate into monopolies he also argued that there is a falling rate of profit now this never really came true this is Marx in theory but the falling rate of profit never really happens he suggests as the ratio of indirect labor uh, machinery grows in relation to direct labor there would be a steady decline in the rate of profit to the point where it wouldn't pay to make a widget Marxist economics also includes finally the growing exploitation of workers that things are produced under a crisis of underconsumption and this creates cycles of recessions and unemployment so this is the Marxist critique of capitalism now if you're looking at historical structuralism and the international political economy we apply then Marxist theory then to international capitalism so the problem is if capitalism should collapse as Marx suggested through what he called the falling rate of profit why does it continue why does it survive and indeed flourish so in the theory of monopoly capitalism when capitalism becomes monopolistic corporations could force the state to support their activities this prevents the collapse of the system so if capitalism becoming monopolistic actually controls the economic system in a country then the state or the government needs to be on board with the capitalist programs to prevent the collapse of the system in other words state and corporations are going to be in bed they're going to be working together because they they provide mutual benefit well then this required consideration of the role of the state in capitalism so in state capital relations there are two theories one un instrumental Marxism and two structural Marxism what we're examining today structuralism structural Marxism so first instrumental Marxism the state is run by or run in the direct interest of capitalists and so the state must be captured by the proletariat in order to stop the force of the capitalists in running the state structural Marxism suggests that the state serves the interests of capitalists over a long period of time but has relative autonomy in the short term and so in the post-war era we found a class compromise which overcame the problem of underconsumption. in other words the state can have activities such as in the New Deal to to bolster the economy to to work with the capitalists to bolster the economy some sometimes to the detriment of capitalists I'm thinking um, specifically Franklin Roosevelt but also um, Teddy Roosevelt in his trust breaking um, activities so in the short term the state can serve the capitalists but over the long term the capitalists uh, have to have the state on board have to have the state as their servant either way through instrumental Marxism or structural Marxism the state protects capitalism and so going back again to Lenin's imperial Lenin's theory of imperialism if capitalism should collapse why does it survive and flourish well it's argued that monopoly capitalism has led to imperialism 
it has overcome domestic falling rate of profit by reaching out to a captured market, a colony, to both import raw materials and to export manufactured materials. And so this is the new imperialism that Lenin suggests leads to nationalism or is reflective of nationalism and eventually to war. Because how does one achieve a colony? Well, when, when um, uh, expansion and colonialism in the 1700s and early 1800s took place, it was simply by matter of occupation and uh, overcoming the native population. But later on in the 1917s, when everything was already taken and occupied, how do you achieve a colony but by war? So the implication is that capitalism must be violently overthrown. So imperialism and conflict are inevitable, and that conflict then is good for societies. So other modern approaches to structuralism include the dependency theory. So if you're not a, a, a colony in, in name, can you be a colony economically? Can you be tied in so, so tightly with what we call a metropolitan society, let's say an industrial society, taking over the economy, the infrastructure of another state, of another nation? Okay, so economic imperialism. You don't have to own the colony. The colony doesn't have to fly your flag. But if you have that, that state, that nation, serving your economic needs, are they not, in effect, colonial? Right. So when we get to China, in a few uh, lectures hence, we'll talk about the Belt and Road Initiative, whereby China is heavily investing in an infrastructure in foreign countries, namely in, in Africa and in Turkmenistan, whereby they are capturing independent nations and ostensibly, arguably, creating them as new economic colonies. And so the sources of dependency theory are first Marxist. It's argued that transnational corporations, we remember, from the North prevented the development in the South for super exploitation. This is the Marxist interpretation that the transnational corporations they are calling the shots, they are working with government and have prevented development in the South so that they can continue to exploit poor undeveloped nations, the Marxist theory of dependency theory. The Latin American structuralism argues that free trade didn't work for the South, that they had nothing to trade, right? That their, their raw materials, whatever they may be, whether it's oil or minerals or perhaps um, subsistence agricultural products, they have nothing to trade. And so Latin American structuralism argues that free trade doesn't work for South America. There are other claims. Developing nations exploited by capitalist states, that capitalism is uneven at its core and its periphery, and that the South is dominated by um, comprador classes or capitalist classes. So the dependency theory implications are such that radicals recommend socialist revolutions or the breakout of global capitalism. Moderates recommend economic nationalism or autonomy from these large capitalist highly developed industrial states, and rather conceive of import substitution industrialization, or ISI, which are tariffs to protect the development of local industries. So how do you achieve economic nationalism? How do you achieve uh, independence and autonomy from the hyper-developed industrial nations? You put tariffs on import to help maintain and develop local industries so that these highly developed nations can't flood a colonial economic market with, with goods that they must buy. One of my favorite examples of import substitution industrialization are a well-intended, ostensibly well-intended program whereby people in highly developed nations, let's say the United States, can donate their clothes for, for distribution in Africa or distribution in poorer countries, in non-industrialized countries. Well, here's the key. And so if you are um, taking your old clothes and donating them ostensibly, they're not necessarily 
99% of the cases being freely given to Africa. And even though they were, still it's going to create a problem. Because if you are now flooding Africa with very, very, very cheap clothes, clothes that have been given, donated, and so there is no, no production cost, right? You're flooding the African market with clothes, with really, really cheap clothes that people can afford. Now, ostensibly, you would say, Mike, that's a good thing, right? These people are, they have clothes, they're able to, to albeit they're used, they're still perfectly serviceable. But when you flood a country with cheap, cheap, cheap clothes that everybody can afford, what is the impetus to go into business to create clothes in that country? You're never going to be able to compete with this nearly, this very low cost alternative. And so import substitution industrialization, tariffs to protect development of local industries would include this kind of an example. Well, there, it, there are problems with dependency theory, such as unclear concepts. What is economic nationalism and how is that related to Marxism? Are they one and the same? Can economic nationalism be inherently Marxism or take elements of Marxism to apply? What is the importance of state power? How energetic is the state, is the government um, in a developing country? And really, there are also empirical questions. What were the successes of the East Asian NICs or net interest costs and how are they thought to disprove this theory? We'll get further back into East Asia's NICs in further lectures. So there are modern approaches. The world systems theory, developed by Wallerstein, derived from the dependency theory but focuses on geographic exploitation of capitalism. This argues that there is a single world capitalist system and that power comes from position in the system. So let's say the G10 or even the G12. If they are the highly developed industrialized nations, the capitalist nations then, this single world capitalist system, the power comes from your position in that system. If you're not part of the G10, then if you're outside that, how does that position you for participation on the world stage? And so I'm thinking very clearly about Russia's you being excluded now from the G10 and President Trump's near insistence pre-COVID, when they were going to have the G10 in the United States, that was canceled by virtue of COVID, whereby he wanted to invite Vladimir Putin in Russia as a representative to the G10, because then that would put Russia as a, a capitalist system in a position of power within the G10. Does that make sense? So states are organized hierarchically. There is a core, there is a semi-periphery, and a, a true periphery. And so the logic of Marxist exploitation is applied to the states. If you're on the periphery, are you not yourself exploited for their surplus value? So if you're in the United States even, and you are in a highly developed country, this idea of Marxist exploitation is applied both within to us, but also to any potential economic colonial nations as well. So the world systems theory, derived from the dependency theory, is vague <laughs> and not well applied. I'm doing my best to, to give it credence. Marxists criticize in this instance the last of lack of class analysis. That we're not really talking about the capitalists and the, the um, proletariat. We're talking about world systems and governments and not individuals. And so international relations scholars criticize the under-theorization, then, of state power in this model. There is also what we call the regulation theory, and this is coined by Liebitz of the regulation school. It's a very structural Marxist approach to international political economy. Regulation theory argues that states create different regimes of accumulation to adapt to changing labor processes. So, for example, after World War II, you have Fordism and Taylorism. And this, this Fordism and Taylorism, as described in your book, required Keynesian economics. It required state participation in coordinating and controlling the economy. But since the 1980s, when we have a birth of neoclassicism, Reagan and Thatcherism, you have what's known as post-Fordism, or 
the profit squeeze, right, that it, it requires neoliberalism. To, to wring the profit out of, out of your processes requires this neoliberal, this Reagan-Thatcherist approach. So political struggle is not as important as the needs of capitalism in this regulation theory. However, there is the problem of economism or economic determinism. Further approaches include the Grammassian or the Neo-Grammassian theory. And this is coined by Gramsci, Cox, Gill, and others, where global politics are understood through a neo-Marxist class analysis. It rejects the economism of regulation theory that we just described. And so some of the concepts of Gramassian theory include the interrelationship of material capabilities, institutions, and ideas that all impact this idea of class struggle. It also has the concept of hegemony, which is seen as class domination or economic ideological domination of an elite class. You also have what are known as organic intellectuals in Gramassian theory, ideological organizers of class politics, let's say the pro-business groups, the Chamber of Commerce. And so Gramassian or Neo-Gramassian theory includes different views of how global relations will evolve, such as cooperation driven by the interests of the MNCs and their global networks of production, multinational corporations, MS, MNCs, and their global networks of production. We're gonna, we talked about that a little bit in Globalism and in Introduction to IPE, and we're going to talk about it further when we talk about production generally in a future lecture. So, deep breath. Thank you for your patience. What are our conclusions? What are the strengths and weaknesses? So, what are our conclusions then? What are the strengths and weaknesses of the arguments that we've been making? Some of the strengths is that we focus on concepts ignored by realism, mercantilism, and liberalism, such as exploitation and inequality. There is a central emphasis on capitalism, and globalization. And so what are the weaknesses? Well, really, you can complain a lot, you can call out, you can say the emperor has no clothes, but what is to be done? For example, with regulation theory, you make a good argument, but what is your prescription? What are you going to do about it? How are we going to change it? There are confusing concepts, and they're not widely applied. Now, I did my best to talk about these different theories, and to prepare for this lecture, I sat down and read quite a bit, and I still don't think I described it very well. These are confusing concepts, and they're not widely applied. So the role of state power is often obscured. When we talk about multinational corporations or transnational corporations, in looking at the economy and in world trade, what is the role of state power, and how is this a problem? So, my friends, we've had quite a journey, haven't we? First, we began talking about France. It seems like forever ago, all right? And then we got into Marxism and Leninism and Stalinism and a lot of the different theories, the more periphery theories of what structuralism looks like. So, here's the question. I would invite you to go back to the Fabians. Remember the Fabians way back when now? When they said, hey, instead of a revolution, perhaps a lot of this can be affected by, oh, I don't know, democratic change. Maybe there can be a call from within a country to address inequalities and to address capitalism. In Fabian ideals, then, what you're looking for is some kind of a parliamentary socialism. Parliamentary socialism meaning that it would be within the country's political system and political culture to create a new mechanism by which we can address the plight of the proletariat. So to choose education and the general acceptance of socialist thought instead of forced violent indoctrination or a revolution. So going back to France then and why I brought up the differences in the French constitution 
the power of the president, the qualified power of the vice, uh, the uh, prime minister, the power of the parliament, the power of the parties, and how after de Gaulle in 1958, they were kind of switched, right? So before, from 46 to 58, parliament had the, the reins of power, but they couldn't form a viable coalition effectively. And so that fourth republic fell, and the fifth republic under, Gaulle's, under de Gaulle's 58 constitution created a more semi-presidential system whereby the president has the power and the parliament is representative. Okay, So that was their mechanism, France's mechanism, to try to achieve a system of government whereby the proletariat, the people, would have a direct say or more of a direct say in actually changing policy. This is what the Fabians were trying to achieve. That's what the Marxist ostensibly theory would achieve but its interpretation by Lenin, by Trotsky, and by Stalin admittedly fell short. So some of these neo-Marxists, then, are describing different ways of looking at colonialism and captured markets, etc. My question for you is now, looking at France, and now having a little better idea of structuralism, how the nature of a nation's culture, history, and political structure helps them affect changes in their political system, how then we would change the focus of the ideas to more of a Marxist analysis, a more focus on the dominant features of society and how those features of society exploit class interests and relative power I invite you to look at the Yellow Vests movement. So if you're not familiar with the Yellow Vests movement, it is something that started in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and still continues to this day. Now this is where you perform your independent research. Going out and getting a, your arms around France's Yellow Vest movement, how did that change French policy? How did that affect the French government how did the culture of the French people, knowing their history, knowing their distrust of centralized government, how did it change the discourse? How effective was it and why? What structural elements in the French system of government allowed the Yellow Vest movement to be successful? So, going back then, to our seminar question, please examine the elements of economic determinism and exploitation using the structuralist perspective as described in your textbook and in this recorded lecture by using contemporary economic policy of France as a case study. And my argument is if you look at the Yellow Vest movement, that will be your in. Now, you don't have to use the Yellow Vest movement. But I would argue that it is a very good starting off place to talk about this issue. My friends, you survived. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your forbearance. I hope this recording finds you well and healthy. And I look forward to our future conversations.